Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Greater Naples. It is a joy to see you all here. Those out in the pavilion enjoying the slightly warmer weather. Those viewing on Facebook Live, thank you for being with us this morning. My name is Tony Fisher, serving this congregation with joy and gratitude. This morning, I would like to express some of that gratitude for the Vision Task Force, who's been working to create a fun and meaningful all-congregational gathering in just three weeks on Saturday, March 16th. If, if the Visioning Our Future event hasn't made it onto your calendar, each and every one of you, I hope you'll take the order of service home and look at the back and put the date right on your calendar. I wouldn't even mind if you pulled out your cell phone right now <laughs> Got to your calendar app and put it in there. So thank you to the task force members, Chris Cowan, Jane Graham, Martha Cornell, Janet Hoffman, Jack Gorski, and Steve Espinoza for really doing a great job so far. And we know that that will continue through the, the event on the 16th. Thank you all for your service. I'm also grateful to have Ed Ostrom here this morning as our worship associate. Good morning, Ed. Good morning indeed, Tony. And good morning to all of you folks, both here and out in the great unknown. <laughs> we bid you welcome, who come with weary spirit, who come with troubles that are too much with you, who come hurt and afraid. We bid you welcome, who come with hope in your heart, who come with anticipation in your step, who come proud and joyous. We bid you welcome who are seekers of a new truth, who come to probe and explore, who come to learn. We bid you welcome who enter this hall as a homecoming, who have found here room for your spirit who find in this people a family. Whoever you are, whatever you are, wherever you are on your journey, we bid you welcome. And now, let's settle into this morning with the morning's prelude.
We come to this place because we need each other. We need to see each other. We need to touch each other, to hug one another. We come to this place to work, to talk, to sing, to laugh, occasionally to dance. We call this a community of faith, not because this building or this space is holy ground, not because we believe the same things, because, but because what we do here, what we say together, what we are here, makes this a sacred gathering. Let's join together in the chalice lighting words you'll see on the screen or in your order of service. In the light of truth, the warmth, the community, and the fire of commitment we gather this day. May the flame we now kindle be to us a symbol of the unity we seek. And if you would rise in body or spirit and join in singing our opening hymn, Come, Come, Whoever You Are. Words will be on the screen. I'm going to give you a break today. Uh, since Sean isn't here, we're not going to do this as a round. <laughs> but Eleanor has some other ideas. Okay, we're going to do this as a round. <laughs> Sean is ill this morning, so we're, we're, our thoughts go to him. And Eleanor is, is conducting the choir, so she has some power uh, here in the congregation. <laughs> Eleanor will lead this group of people, and I will lead this group of people. We'll sing it through once together, and maybe twice as a round. Does that sound good to you? All right. You've got to shout it out, right? Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving. Ours is no caravan of despair. Come, yet again, come. Come, come, whoever you are. Wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving. Ours is no caravan of despair. Come, yet again, come. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, ours is no caravan of despair. Come, yet again, come. Beautiful. Thank you, Eleanor, very much. I often uh, enter the weekend uh, of a service, which means just about every weekend, with a little trepidation because I'm never quite sure where I'm going to go. I mean, I have an idea. I mean, there's a title in the newsletter uh, and a blurb, so there's got to be some direction that I'm thinking about. But uh, often there's so many directions to go, so many diversions to take, so many wormholes to follow and fall into. And I am easily distracted. <laughs> the distractions this week come in the form of some news, unfortunate news. This, is, this, week, this past week marks the beginning of the third year of the war in Ukraine. It marks the continuation of a war in Gaza, a war that seems unconscionable to many of us, despite our faith. It marks the week when the Florida legislature decided that it was in their power to determine what 16-year-olds could do on social media. 
a legislature that also continues to try and limit a woman's ability to make her own choices about reproductive health care. A legislature who thinks they can decide what an open education is for our children, but limits their freedom to learn the truth. A legislature where LGBTQ people are continually targeted to be shamed and dismissed. It's hard to keep a focus when all these things are going on. And yet I was reminded during this week as well that when I was heading back, when I was heading to seminary in 2010, not that long ago, it was a decision specifically to move towards the issues that confront the world and not pull away. I remember the events, or I was remembering the events that were going on in the world as, as that time approached and, and as I moved on through my seminary experience. And think about the earthquake in Haiti, which was in 2010, which still leaves that country devastated, leaderless. And think about the Occupy movement. It was a huge thing in our country, an effort to make democracy really egalitarian. In my own neck of the woods in Boston in 2013, there was the marathon bombing, a terrorist attack. And one of the things I remember more clearly about that event was that those first responders, whether they were actually professional or not, those first responders that were, were people who ran toward the problem, ran toward the blasts to see how they could engage, what they could do. So you see some of the, the various directions my mind has been off on this week. But I, I did want to reflect a little bit on that seminary experience now 14 years ago. And my first course in, Unitarian, in the Unitarian Universalist uh, curriculum was a, a course in Unitarian Universalist history taught by the Reverend Mark Harris, who was at that time the minister of our congregation in Watertown, Massachusetts. Mark is the author of the A to Z of American Unitarian Universalism, and the book Elite, Uncovering Classism in Unitarian Universalist History, the text which we will be coming back to a little bit later. Mark was really a wonderful teacher. He was engaged, he was thoughtful. He got us immediately into doing our own primary research projects, digging around in the history files of our local home congregations and trying to see how those histories, those very specific histories tied to the larger history of the Unitarian Universalist movement. He was even handed about celebrating the many contributions of Unitarian Universalist men and women over the centuries of all colors all persuasions, and he challenged us in our final project, actually, to write biographies of prominent Unitarian Universalists who weren't represented in the online dictionary of Unitarian and Universalists, the online dictionary of um, or biographies of Unitarian Universalists, which exists in case you're interested in finding out more about people that we bring up on Sunday mornings. One of the things that seminary actually uh, was supposed to do, not just for Unitarian Universalists, but pretty much for every student there, was to shake us up a little bit. Shake our starry-eyed view of the world and of our particular belief structure so that we could get our fir feet firmly replanted in reality before we got our heads back up into the clouds uh, of our beliefs. In my early a Christian church history uh, course, I had seen some of, of my fellow students struggle with the stark realities 
of the early church and the understanding that personality, politics, and power played as much or more a role in framing the theology of the Catholic Church than anything Jesus ever said. Now it was my turn to have some of my foundations disrupted and my optimism tempered. This was a time when our Unitarian Universalist denomination, movement, faith, tradition, however you want to describe it, was approaching its 50th anniversary. And we were looking to figure out who we were and what we could be into the future. There were signs of hope for the denomination, demographic information that showed that while more and more people were leaving mainline denominations, many were identifying themselves as spiritual but not religious. And didn't that sound like us? And wouldn't it make sense that some of those folks might find a home in our congregations? There were also frustrating signals that we hadn't or couldn't or wouldn't take advantage of those shifts. The Pew Research Center's report on America's changing religious landscape revealed that between 2007 and 2014, the Christian share of the population fell from 78% to about 70%. A drop mostly felt in mainline congregations and Catholic churches and to a lesser degree in evangelical congregations. And during that same period, the number of people who chose not to affiliate or identify with particular religion increased. When you put the percentages into raw numbers, it it sort of indicated there were about 72 million people out there who categorized themselves as nuns, not N-U-N-S, but nuns. (laughs) Nuns meaning no religious affiliation. So again, you'd think that a good number of those might might, might have found their way into our congregations across the country, but that hasn't been the case. Today, we're going to look maybe at why that is. And depending on what data you look at, either Unitarian Universalism has grown a little over the last decade or so, or it's remained constant, which is pretty much what I see. It doesn't show the kind of response to the changing landscape of our country, the changing needs of our country. We think we have something to offer here, our good news about being the place where you can nurture your spirit and help heal the world. But it doesn't seem to be drawing others to our doors in any significant way. So what what is going on? Our tradition seems to promise that we can become a people who not only profess a diverse and inclusive faith, but who can foster religious communities that reflect actual diversity. Is that really true? It's a question that still needs an answer. Let's stay seated and center ourselves with this morning centering hymn number 1008, When Our Heart is in a Holy Place. Number 1008. When our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, we are blessed with love and amazing grace. When our heart is in a holy place, when we tell the story deep of us, And we see our faces in each other's eyes. Then our heart is in a holy place. When our heart is in a holy place. When our heart is in a holy place. 
We are blessed with love and amazing grace when our heart is in a holy place. When we tell our story from deep inside and we listen with a loving mind and we hear our voices in each other's words, then our heart is in a holy place. When our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, we bless with love and amazing grace when our heart is in a holy place. Sorry about that. As much as I have been dealing with emotional responses to things in this week and in my life, so each of you have as well, and we come together as a community to share with one another, whether we're sitting on the pavilion after service or as we come in the door beforehand, as we're mingling in the sanctuary here, we share with one another our thoughts and our feelings. This particular time gives us the space to share something that is important to us in our hearts, something, a joy or a sorrow that we're holding that we would like to share with the community. If you have something that you want to share, I hope you'll raise your hand. Tell us what's in your heart. And share your name before you do so. Hi, I'm Harriet Lancaster, and I have a joy. My old friend from my university days at Pitt, uh, Dr. Irv Garfinkel, is here visiting. And um, we also did some graduate work together with my husband, Jim. Wow. Welcome, Irv. My name is Dina Sewell, and this is very difficult for me. Last just after Thanksgiving, I shared with you that my niece's husband had gone through assisted suicide in the Netherlands. This week, we were told that this young person whose birth name was Isa had been used she'd gone through some trans issues and with a name of course, which she took. She sat down on the railroad line in Eindhoven in Netherlands and died. And I kept thinking about last Sunday and these incredible speakers we had here. And one of them talked about the, they developed some sort of an underground railroad for trans people to get out of states where they are in danger. Mm -hmm. And I asked her to send it to me. And it, I, I texted her. And it's actually called Pink Haven Coalition. And they say, we are a collective of organizations and individuals who are all committed to trans liberation and joy and to growing community defense, mutual aid, and alternative systems of care for gender diverse people. So, Tony, you tell us not to do any pol anything political statement. Why aren't these two things that my family have experienced not political in nature? They are, and they're also a deep personal yes. reflection. So thank you for sharing. One years old. Thank you, Dina. I'm Joanne Husky, and I'm sitting here next to a, what I think is a holy place, because it used to be, for years and years and years, Flo Beckler sat here. And she was a prominent Unitarian Universalist mm -hmm. who, for her whole life, tried to understand and get to know everything about the most important issues of the day, and to highlight them in the forum, 
and to talk to people and meet everybody. She was an incredible role model, and I, I miss her. <laughs> Thanks, Joy. Hi, my name's Barb Berger, and I've been in, in this beautiful place for like a month, and I'm going home to my Unitarian church <laughs> next week. <laughs> I'm excited about this. This is very nice, too. It's been great to have you here, Barbara. Hi, my name is Ed Johnston. My wife Marge and I are snowbirders from Pittsburgh, and we enjoy very much coming here in uh, February and March. I have a personal joy this week. After waiting four long years, on Thursday, February 29th, I'm going to have a real birthday. <laughs> How many would that be, Ed? <laughs> Twenty. <laughs> would that we had more 20-year birthdays in our sanctuary. Uh, so my name is John Niels, and we've been coming, my wife and I, Gail, have been coming here for the last two or three years increasingly frequently. We love this place, and we're celebrating a visit by our dear friends Rod Boggs and Tazy Berkeley. Uh, Rod uh, spent uh, how many? About 45 years as as uh, executive director of the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights hmm. and Urban Affairs, and he is uh, he, terrifically respected in, in our wonderful Washington. Uh, the legal community, and Tazy Berkeley is just a gem of a human being, <laughs> and we're, we're fortunate to have them both here. Thanks, John, and welcome. My name is Judy Freiberg, and I would like to thank this congregation um, for announcing our need to send some flyers out to some underserved communities in Collier County to help everybody be aware of the Army Corps of Engineers feasibility study. Um, I am so happy that it was announced at the pulpit and so many of you um, ponied up and helped us. So thank you very much. Good morning, Vincent Keys is my name. I am uh, happy to report that we are coming to the close of the school year. <laughs> it is so good, but um, we do have one report of a student who received a scholarship to attend the Air Force Flight Academy, a $500,000 scholarship, and we are so proud of her. Thank you. Awesome. such great work that the NAACP does uh, in companionship with so many other groups and organizations and individuals. Anyone else this morning? Let us be grateful for all those things that have been shared, great joys, deep sorrows. We recognize that each one of us has experienced pain and sorrow and loss and tragedy. And these things are woven so closely together. There is not one without the other. The depth and breadth of human experience exists within us and within all of us in this room. Let's settle ourselves into a time of meditation and silence. Spirit of life and love, God of our deepest understanding, 
We wake each day to our own expectations. We can be filled with hope or dread. We can be filled with love or loneliness. We can be filled with wonder or apathy. We can be filled with joy or the weight of responsibility. We can be filled with the mix of all these things. We come here from diverse backgrounds and differing experiences. Some of us born into comfort, some into struggle. Some of us still worry about making ends meet. Some don't have to. Some of us boast a higher education. Some of us have learned life's lessons in other ways. Some of us approach life with caution, some with zeal. Most of us fit somewhere in between. Spirit of love, we arise from the common stock of all humanity. We all share the secret pain of growth and self-discovery. We all know the ache of parting and loss. We all harbor fears that hold us back from our potential. We all wish for something more. We all need love, acceptance, a sense of belonging. And all of us have these things to give. In this time of uncertainty and upheaval, may we be sure of ourselves in this, that when a hand reaches out to us, we will offer a ready response not with qualifying questions, but with an open mind, a healing heart, and ready hands.
I want to talk to you about pain. We all know physical pain. We fell off bicycles as children. And many of us suffer with arthritis and many adult illnesses. We all know pain, physical pain. We all know, or at least many of us know, emotional pain. That deep, gut-wrenching pain that elicits tears. But I want to talk to you about another pain called being poor. We all know what the word poor means, but you may not know how porn, poor, <laughs> being poor feels. My research reveals that a poor person lacks not only food, but nutrition, dies before his or her time, is underschooled, has insufficient cooking fuel, has no place to go to the bathroom, feels ignored, drinks impure water, has no electricity, lacks housing, and of course, has unattended medical needs, is underpaid if lucky enough to have a job. Such a person suffers, feels left out, is lonely, and is emotionally drained. I've just described the lives of 42 million people who live, no, no, they don't live, they, they endure here in the United States. And 70% of them are women and children. Poor people have no say in government. There are no organizations that try to give them a, a voice. 40 years ago, a lady Michelle uh, Ann, that's her full, first full name, Michelle Ann, Bewe, B-E-W-E-E, -E, founded a Rise for Social Justice. Michelle Ann worked to give voice to the poor in her hometown of Springfield, Massachusetts. In 1985, at the age of 71, she died but she left a mark on that city, and she left us with this poem. Here's how to drive the poor crazy. Tell us it's not charity. Make us beg for it. Don't be available by phone. Make us wait until the off in the office until we discover we're gone for the day. Put us in lines in the cold where, where, where we are ashamed to complain to each other. Close the factories, open the soup kitchens, tell us there's nothing we can do. Bury us in forms and file numbers. Lose our paperwork. Teach us to work in obsolete fields. Offer us plastic for unheated apartments. Ch shame our children for having bad teeth and for wearing sneakers in January. Underpay the parents and give the kids free lunch. Close the schools. Open the training centers. Make sure the checks are late especially before Christmas. Refuse to cash our checks for lack of sufficient funds. Jack up the prices in our neighborhood. Give us medicine Medicaid won't pay for. Give us vouchers no one will accept. Take out the pay phones. Make the bus lines end nowhere. Raise the rents and open the shelters. Here's how to bring on your own downfall. 
get us together in the same waiting room once too often. Make the size of the lie greater so our last illusions are destroyed. Put more of us in jail. Keep eliminating options. Send our children home smaller one more time. But just look away for a moment. Can we become a people who not only profess a diverse and inclusive faith, but also foster religious communities that actually reflect diversity? Ultimately, what I want to say this morning is that equity, diversity, inclusion are not just something we need to work for out there. It's something we also need to struggle for in our hearts and minds and in the context of this community. Mark Harris, in his book Elite, Uncovering Classism in Unitarian Universalist History, tells an interesting story about Margaret Fuller, who is sometimes called America's first feminist and one of the leading transcendentalist thinkers of her day. Margaret was brought up in privilege. She was educated mostly by her father in a comfortable home. But when a time came for her to go off to school, she balked. Her father wrote her a letter. And he wrote... 
your reluctance, your reluctance to go among strangers cannot be too soon overcome. And the way to overcome it is not to remain at home, but to go among them and resolve to deserve and obtain the love and esteem of those who have never before known you. With them, you have a fair opportunity to begin the world anew. This speaks about Margaret going out into the world from her point of privilege. But how do we reflect that diversity here? Ed's reading of the poem about poverty was hard to listen to. And yet, our economic status is something that we struggle with. Class is not something that has had much attention lately in the world news, given that there's so much else to grab our attention. In her study on class, author and historian Nancy Eisenberg points out the obvious that class is economic stratification created by wealth and privilege. The problem, Eisenberg writes, is that popular American history is most commonly told, even dramatized, without much reference to the existence of social classes. It's as though in separating ourselves from Great Britain in the late 1700s, the United States somehow magically escaped the bonds of class and derived a higher consciousness of enriched possibility. The hallowed American dream is the gold standard by which we judge politicians and voters, how we as voters need think about expressing ourselves and are meant to measure the quality of our lives. Have we achieved the American dream? And those cherished myths are at once uplifting and also debilitating. All men are created equal was successfully employed as a motto to define the promise of America's open spaces and a united people's moral self-regard in distinguishing themselves from a host of hopeless societies abroad. The American experience lifted us up theoretically above others. Right from the beginning, our Unitarian and Universalist forebears were caught up in this same narrative. And both traditions incorporated the ideal of an egalitarian society into our rhetoric, into our language, but our congregations have rarely reflected that ideal. In the book, Turning Point, Essays on a New Unitarian Universalism, the Reverend Fred Muir wrote about a trinity of errors that has drained the vitality out of our movement for such reasons that we're talking about. Kept us from being relative to a large group of people who might otherwise gravitate in our direction. Reverend Muir identified three things. First, he said, we are being held back and stymied by a persistent, pervasive, disturbing, and disruptive commitment to individualism that misguides our ability to engage the changing times. This is something that's very complex. We certainly believe in the individual's right to, to access and achieve on their own success, excellence, But what we believe in terms of what we are offering someone in our society sort of initiates or uh, gives us the sense that they can lift themselves up with education. They can lift themselves up in this society. When that's sometimes difficult. We have wonderful organizations like the NAACP who works really hard to create opportunity for students here in Collier County. 
but they can only reach a certain number. And in helping them lift themselves up, yes, that helps lift us, lift us all up. But we do believe in that individualism. That it's an individual's hope and responsibility to make a difference for themselves. Muir suggests that we cling to an exceptionalism that is often insulting to others and undermines our good news. We are one of the most highly educated religious groups in the country. We are one of the wealthiest religious groups in the country. We lift up our exceptionalism to the point sometimes where it is daunting for someone to walk into this space. We are who we are, some folks say. But if we're to live our values, we need to try and find another path. The third thing that Muir talked about in terms of what has drained us of our vitality is our allergy to authority, in his own words. And that exists in our local congregations and beyond. And if I read Muir correctly, it's a condition that builds distrust in those who hold leadership roles and a reluctance to step into those roles in the first place. Ours is a rich heritage, but there's some truth, I think there's truth in Muir's analysis and much in our inherited tradition that can be problematic as we move towards a less than certain future. In, Mur, in Muir's, to Muir's trilogy, I would add my own observation that as a movement, we've long celebrated our rich intellectual life, and that's good, but we've done so by, while distrusting the fullness of human nature that includes our physical bodies, our emotions, and our passions. We are not all our reason. In fact, our reason often is the interpreter of what's going on in our bodies. We respond to the world with our bodies, and then we begin to rationalize what we're feeling. Our intellectual tendencies also tend to keep us from exploring the depths of our religious natures, whether we seek that within, out in nature somewhere, or in something we might call the divine. God. As heirs of a liberal religion, we don't always know what to do with the religion part. And along those lines, we've forgotten that liberal religion is not the same thing as liberal politics. I've said once before, or many times before, that religion stems from the Latin root religare, which simply means to bind together. And liberal religion holds that we don't get stuck binding ourselves up in old ways and creeds, but we find revelation and new ideas about what it means to be alive and human in a changing world. That doesn't mean we necessarily cast off all the things we walk through these doors with, all our histories, all our tradition, all the different faiths that are represented in this room. Yes, sometimes we walk away but sometimes, too, we're walking towards something, towards a community that seems to be energized around justice, perhaps, or that doesn't demand a certain particular way of believing. We have in this room an incredible diversity of belief, believe it or not. I hear it when we have our orientations every month. I hear it in comments that perhaps this isn't necessarily a welcoming space for people who might call themselves followers of Jesus or who hold the idea of a loving God. And that response sometimes finds its voice in the community when we talk about Christianity in some way. We might fear a little undercurrent of murmurs. We 
when I looked into the, the data about how people who identify as Christian, um, the numbers of people is decreasing who identify, part of that movement away is a reaction to a very evangelical point of view that doesn't represent someone, everyone with a Christian faith. Do we offer in this space a place for the Christian and the Jew and the Hindu and the Muslim and the Buddhist and the atheist and the humanist? Because that is what our values say we are. It's hard to put the word religious elitism to Unitarian Universalism, but in fact, maybe that's what it is. Ibu Patel, the energetic interfaith leader, defines pluralism as an achievement characterized by three elements, respect for different identities, positive relationships between diverse communities, and a commitment to the common good. The other part of our pluralism, because pluralism, as you remember, is one of those values we're lifting up uh, in our new Unitarian Universalist language. The other part of pluralism must be a willingness to engage people of other traditions openly without prejudice or fear of elitism, because it is only then when we can let our barriers down and find common ground from which we can work together, from which we can move towards the issues that confront us today. The course in liberation theology that I took in seminary was probably one of the most important of my academic training. And one of the readings I remember most came from Latin American liberation theologist Gustavo Gutierrez. Gutierrez taught that the two most important questions we can ever ask ourselves were asked in one of the early creation stories held in the book of Genesis. It's the ancient story that tells of the first act of human violence when Cain murders his brother Abel and then hides from God in shame and in confusion. God comes looking for Cain, where are you? And then asks, where is your brother? And Gutierrez wrote that these same two questions are falling around us all the time. Like invisible rain, he wrote. Where are we? Where are we in the tangled matrix of privilege and power, of wealth and poverty, of belief? Where are we in understanding that truth comes to people of all backgrounds? Knowledge comes from people of many different experiences and different levels of education. Who are we? Who and where is our brother? Attending well to these questions is not easy practice, but it's what we're called to in our faith. It asks us, our faith reminds us to be Mindful of our place in the interdependent web of all existence. Mindful of which strands connect us. And how our circumstances are all linked. Places of abundance and safety. Places of scarcity and danger. We are inextricably linked. And also... Those of us who live in abundance and safety have an urgent mandate to attend as well as we can to those who live in want and peril. We are linked. Another core value of Unitarian Universalism calls us to run towards trouble and make ourselves present. where there is need. That declared the wholeness and 
the wholeness of every person, the inherent dignity and worth of every person is central to who we are as a people. And that people of inherent worth and dignity come from all walks of life. And we cannot separate ourselves from them. What I know, what I struggle with personally, is that there are no easy answers to the questions of this day. None of the issues that separate us from our ideals, classism, intellectualism, exceptionalism, racism, and aversion to religious beliefs that don't match our own None of these are simple issues. All are multi-layered, complex problems that live deep within our national family system and inside ourselves. We struggle in part because we are in many ways working within the American narrative of that wonderful egalitarian society that we hope for, that we wish for, that we dream of, but we separate ourselves from with all those isms. Part of that has to do with the fact that our own stories don't necessarily jibe with the narratives. Some of us have grown up in poverty. Some of us still struggle. Some of us grew up with great abundance and still enjoy that. In our anxiety over the national debate, we sometimes tend to want to lump people together in a group to dehumanize them because they present an obstacle to whatever outcomes to which we aspire. Martin Luther King Jr.'s vision of beloved community was not set in heaven. It was a vision grounded in practical theology that saw the possibility of peace, justice, and love right here on this planet. We have long matched our Unitarian Universalist vision to King's ideal, but we have never fully and internally embraced the idea that the beloved community must include all kinds of people, not just the social circle we create of like-minded liberals. It must be practiced in an ever-widening circle if our faith is going to be truly relevant in the future. Could we become such a community that welcomes true diversity? It wouldn't be easy, and perhaps it's not really doable. But each day offers a possibility of beginning the world anew, and we all have stories to tell. So take a deep breath. And let's actually move towards the kind of good trouble John Lewis might talk about, towards equity, towards pluralism, towards the future. No, I'm okay, thanks. When we join this church, nothing is asked of us. However, there are implied obligations that are rarely spoken. But perhaps from time to time they should be spoken. To the extent we are physically, mentally, and financially able, it is an obligation to support one another And this church, with our compassion, with our wisdom, and with our talents, with our knowledge, and yes, with our energy and wealth. Some see this as a multiple choice list. A list where one can select some of these obligations. That is not so. This list, in part, is an example of what it means 
to be a Unitarian Universalist as we endeavor to practice all of them. At this time in our service, we provide you with an opportunity to share your wealth with the works of this church, to impress the lives of all who enter here, and with the communities where we live in order to foster and improve the lives of all who dwell within both, and we thank you for being a participant towards the achievement of this endeavor. Given the time, I think we'll forego our closing hymn, but there are a few announcements uh, for us today. Uh, after the service today, we have another fabulous forum, um, with uh, this, uh, this time with Bertha Vasquez and Janice Bird. The title of their forum will be, Don't Believe Everything You Believe. Uh, Steve, oh, if you come on forward, um, or you want to shout from there, there's a, there, we have a wonderful concert this afternoon at 4 o'clock. You want to just shout it out?
haven't already made plans, I just encourage you to come out. It's going to be a fabulous afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Steve, very much. Uh, this is the last Sunday of uh, Nancy Iannatelli's art down in Menneker Gallery, so if you haven't been down there, I hope you have, uh, please take a look, just a fabulous uh, exhibit. Um, and I'm about to tell you what's gonna happen uh, next week for the gallery and, and beyond, but uh, wonderful Wednesday this week will be a continuation as Janet Hoffman and I explore restorative practices and restorative circles as a way of resolving conflict. So next Sunday, big announcements. There will be three connected events here at UUCGN. On our walls here in the sanctuary and along our main corridor, we will have an exhibit titled Focus on Abortion, Americans Share Their Stories. It's a portrait exhibit with accompanying stories of individuals whose voices are often missing from the national debate. Women who have had an abortion or people who are close to the abortion experience, including partners and professionals who provide abortion, abortion care. Following the service next week, there'll be a form entitled Enough is Enough, Reclaiming Reproductive Freedom with a panel of experts from Planned Parenthood. Then later in the afternoon, the Friends of Planned Parenthood, an organization that, uh, the Friends organization has at least seven members in this congregation, We'll be hosting a different program and a reception for the exhibit from 4 to 6 p.m. This is an event that requires registration, which you can do online, or you can also see Daryl Manning. Daryl, raise your hand and wave your hand. She's in the back. Um, after the service today, and she'll be waiting outside the back door of the sanctuary with a clipboard. We would also like, uh, for that event, for you UCGN members to wear their UU identification tag so we know who you are. So, I appreciate your patience this morning. I hope that you will go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, return to no person evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all beings. Have a wonderful day.